People, welcome back to the Arsenio Buck Show, and bringing to you today is, uh, I'm bringing to you today a very, very interesting podcast, because, uh, first and foremost, Stephen Covey is a brilliant mastermind. I was going through my podcast list yesterday, and I realized all his specific podcasts that I did on, you know, specific areas of his book were of the highest, and they would probably trump 20 other podcasts. So, I was actually reading Empathic Listening again. And the follow-up to Empathic Listening was basically the four autobiographical, biographical, biographical, there we go, biographical responses to how, let's just say, parents always respond to their children. But this also relates to basically people who are in relationships. And I couldn't believe what I was reading. Because, of course, you know, let's just, let's just put it this way. Like, I did a nice little podcast on Empathic Listening and whatnot, and a lot of people listened to it, and they loved it. And guys, it all centers around this. Empathic listening is basically not putting yourself into the other person's shoes or putting your life into their shoes, but rather developing the necessary skills to actually, I guess, be for the person in their argument. So I'm going to go over so many different things right now. I'm not, I'm not even exactly sure how long this podcast is going to be, but let's just put it this way. It's going to be very, very long. Um, but let's just, uh, let's look at it this way. I was in Australia, right? And I have a friend by the name of Joy. And while she's talking in the car, and I I still remember the scene. I swear it was a day before the Tough Mudder. We were going to the store, and I just kept saying, "Uh uh-huh. Oh, interesting. Okay. These ridiculous ass responses basically indicating that I am not responding. I mean, that I really do not care about what she's saying. And she called me out on it. She's like, um, you're really not listening to me right now. I said, oh, my God. And I'm like, oh my, you know what? I've been doing this in terms of Thailand too, rather than, because sometimes I just lose focus and I start thinking about the things I need to do next in terms of my entrepreneurial career. And I'm not focusing on the now. So what I really want to do Let's talk about some of these four. Let's talk about the four autobiographical. Autobiogra- uh, I hate this word. I'm going to call it ABG. Let's call it ABG. ABG responses. So basically, there are four. We evaluate. We either agree or disagree. We probe. Probe meaning we ask questions from our own frame of reference. Now, this actually is the worst. I I really do believe that, but you know, we're going to get into it. We advise, we give counsel based on our own experience, or we interpret. We try to figure people out to explain their motives, their behavior, based on our own motives and behaviors. You see what I mean? So probing, obviously, that's asking the 20 questions, which ultimately, (laughs) and you know what? It kind of goes around like this. Let's, Let's just put it this way. How's it going, son? fine. Well, what's been happening lately? Nothing. So what's exciting in school? Not much. And what are your plans for the weekend? I don't know. See, those one to three word answers explains it all. Because we get this. We get this a lot. We get this in terms of actually developing conversations with some people. Um, One instance, there was a girl at the gym who went on a trip to Chile for two weeks and she's Thai. You never hear of a Thai woman ever going to Chile. Okay. Oh, no, wasn't she late? Uh, Switzerland. Okay. She went all by herself. So I saw her again. I was like, hey, so how was Switzerland? Good. Was it cold? Yeah. How cold was it? I like the cold. It didn't even relate. That answer didn't even relate. That was it. I shut her down. And not only did I shut her down, I never tried conversing with her ever again. Because I do find that to be very, very disrespectful. So I could tell from my friend Joy's standpoint... It could really, really piss it. Well, I mean, well, the thing is, it's like, oh, okay, interesting, interesting. But it's still those one to three word responses. Now, in terms of basically um, a parent, from a parent standpoint, oh, man, they always do that. I told you so, right? It's kind of like my mom. I'd be like, mom, oh, my God, Thailand this, Thailand that. And you know what her response always is? Well, you're the one that wanted to go out there. You know what I mean? But no, she didn't really say that. But in terms of every other situation I've had throughout my life, my mom always advises me in the same incorrect way. So that's probably why she doesn't tell me, you know, she doesn't really talk to me much at all because she doesn't know what kind of response to give me. I mean, if I go up to my mom and I say, mom, you know what? I've had it. 
you know, I've had it with this job. I don't know what else to do. I'm trying to figure out what I should do. My mom can't give me the necessary step. I say, okay, hold on. And, and this is why this is going to help so many people out there because knowing the autobiographical responses, okay, the A, B, G, it's going to help you in terms of all your relationships. So let's put it this way. Let's look at a typical conversation between a father and a teenage son. Okay, so here we go. Boy, dad, I've had it. School is for the birds. Now, school is for the birds. That's basically an idiom. Basically, school is for, oh, let's, let's just say, put it this way. It's not for human beings. And of course, a dad's typical response will be, what's the matter, son? That's the probing. He says it's totally impractical. I don't get a thing out of it. And then, of course, the father would respond and say, hey, well, you just can't see the benefits yet, son. I felt the same way when I was your age. However, moving on later, you know, moving on and later on, it became very helpful. Just hang in there. You see what I mean? That's called the advising part of it. So if we go even further, the boy goes on to say, he says, hey, um, well, let's just put it this way. It's given 10 years of my life. Why the heck do I need to learn X plus Y? To become an auto auto mechanic. And then the father says, an auto mechanic? You've got to be kidding me. So he's evaluating the situation now. No, I'm not. Look at Joe. He's quit school. He's working on cars and makes a lot of money now. And of course, the father responds and says, that might be the case now. But in several years, he will be wishing he'd stay in school. And so, of course, the boy says, I don't know. Joe's got a pretty good setup. And then, of course, the father goes on to say, and say, you know, look, son, have you really tried? Now he's probing and evaluating. And then the next one, he says, it's been uh, I've been in high school for 10 years and it's been a waste. Then, of course, the father says, you're at a great school. Give them some credit. Advising and evaluating. And then he says, well, the other guys feel the same way I do. And then the father goes on to respond and says, do you realize how difficult it was for your mother and I to get you there? You can't just quit after coming this far. Now he's evaluating the situation again. And the boy goes on to say, I know you've sacrificed dad, but it's just not worth it. And then he says, well, look, maybe if you were doing your homework and spending less time on TV, advising and evaluating, then boom, the boy interrupts. He says, never mind. I don't want to talk about this anyway. Boom. The father has basically overdrawn the emotional bank account. And now his son is going to end up, uh, I guess you could say he's going, um, He's not going to talk to his father much anymore. And then that's when the one to three word responses come. You see what I mean? This is how situations always unfold. I mean, even looking at it, you're at a great school. I don't even know what school is anymore. I don't even, personally, me, me, Arsenio Buck. Yes, I don't even know what school is anymore. I don't even know what an education is anymore. I don't give a damn if you go to a Harvard, a Cambridge, or this, or that. What are you going to do to change the people who you come across for the rest of your life? You know? So if my son says, you know, hey, dad, I've had it. School's for the birds. I'm going to have to tell him the truth. I'm going to say, well, you got a point. <laughs> <laughs> because, okay, get in the basic, okay, that basic education. You know, you next, you know, you get to high school, the next, you're adding Y equals MX plus B. I'm going to tell him the truth. I'm not a fool. But then the father had the audacity to say, do you realize how difficult it was for your mother and I to get you in there and you just want to quit? Don't see now you're putting yourself into his shoes and now you're putting blame on him when it has nothing to do about what you and your wife has sacrificed. I hate it when people play that card. And you know what? Then he goes on to say, well, maybe if you don't spend so much, if you spend more time on your homework rather than TV, what does that have to do about school in general? Yeah, homework's going to make me more enthused and happy about, <laughs> you know, going to school. Come on. And so this is why emotional bank accounts are so overdrawn. So let's look at it this way. Let's look at it from the boy's perspective. So here we go. Boy, dad, I've had it. School's for the birds. See, now the boy, he says, I want to talk with you to get your attention. So the father says, hey, what's the matter, son? That's showing that you're interested. Good. It's totally impractical. I don't get a thing out of it. Now, he's saying that I've got a problem at school and I feel just terrible. And so the father goes on to say, well, you just can't see the benefits yet, son. I felt the same way when I was your age. Oh, no. Here comes 
chapter three of dad's autobiography. This isn't what I want to talk about. I don't really care how many miles he had to trudge through the snow to school, you know, without any boots. I want to get to the problem. And so, again, quote, I remember thinking, what a waste of time, you know, the classes, the time and everything going on. Uh, But you don't see the benefits right now, but you'll probably see it later on. Just hang in there. Give it some time. Time won't solve my problem. This is what the boy's thinking. Time will not solve my problem. I wish I could tell you. I wish I could just spit it out. I've given 10 years of my life. Can you tell me what good X plus Y is going to do, you know, for me as, you know, in terms of me becoming an auto mechanic? An auto mechanic? You've got to be kidding me. He wouldn't like me. Now the boy's thinking he wouldn't like me if I were an auto mechanic. He wouldn't like me if I didn't finish school. I have to justify what I just said. No, I'm not. Look at Joe. He's quit school. He's working on cars and he's making lots of money. Now that's practical. And then the father goes on to say, he says, hey, it may look that way now, but several years from, you know, down the road, Joe's going to be wishing he had stayed in school. Oh boy, here comes the lecture number 16 on the value of an education. You don't want to be an auto mechanic. Oh, how do you know that, dad? Do you really have any idea what I want? You need an education to prepare for something better than that. Oh, I don't know. Joe's got a pretty good setup. He's not a failure. He didn't finish school and he's not a failure. I will repeat that. He is not a failure. Look, son, have you really tried? Oh, now. Oh, we're beating around the bush. We're beating around the bush, dad. Good job. Here we go. Dad, if you would just listen to me, I really need to talk to you about something important. I've been in high school. For two years. Sure, I've tried. It's just a waste. That's a highly respected school, son. Just give them a little credit. Oh, great. Now we're talking about credibility. I wish I could just talk about what I want to talk about. Well, the other guys, dad, feel the same way I do. I have some credibility, too. I'm not a moron. But then the father goes on to say, do you realize how many sacrifices your mother and I have had to make to get you where you are? Uh Uh-oh, here comes the guilt trip. Maybe I'm a moron. The school's great. Mom and dad are great. And I'm a moron. You can't can't quit. You've come too far. I know you've sacrificed that, but it's just not worth it. You just don't understand. And then the father goes on to say, homework over TV. That's not my problem, dad. That's not it at all. I've never been able to tell you. I was dumb to try. And see, now you guys can see, can you see how limited we are when we try to understand another person on the basis of just words alone? Especially when we're looking at, uh, you know, another person through our own glasses. Can you see how limiting our autobiographical responses are to a person who is genuinely just trying to understand his own autobiography, you know, autobiography? You will never be able to truly step inside another person to see the world as he does well i guess as he she your daughter your son whatever you want to call it as he sees it see this is why a lot of foreigners here who are teachers who are of age they don't understand what i had to go through here they don't listen in terms of these four autobi- uh, autobiographical responses which i'm going to be getting into really really shortly they don't listen in terms of that They just put everything through their eyes. They just say, oh, you need to rise above it. You need to rise above it. (sighs) That's easy for a 70-year-old man who was from Britain, who's Anglo, to say, what? I need to rise up. You know what? Done. And see, this is how these withdrawals just build up and then boom, that's it. I never speak to the human beings again. See, until you develop the pure desire, the strength of personal character, and the positive emotional bank account, as well as the empathic listening skills to do it, you're never going to be able to become an effective listener. So, here we go. You want the stages? I got the stages. The four developmental stages. Okay, first, you can mimic what they say. This is one way to do it. This is a skill... That uh, I've talked about in terms of active and reflective listening. So example, boy, dad, I've had it. School is for the birds. And then you repeat, you've had it. You think school is for the birds. See, you simply repeated what your son said. You didn't evaluate. You didn't probe. You didn't advise. You didn't interpret. Nothing. You've just shown that you're paying attention. Not just giving the bullshit typical response. Oh, what's the matter, son? Now. 
Moving on to the next one. So we got Mimic for, of course, the number one. The second is called Rephrasing the Content. So, another example. Boy, Dad, I've had it. School is for the birds. Oh, you don't want to go to school anymore. See, this time, you've put his meaning into your own words. Now you're thinking about what he said, mostly with the left side, the reasoning, logical side of the brain. So the third stage, we bring the right brain into operation. You reflect the feeling. So when you reflect the feeling, it basically goes something like this. He says, boy, dad, I've had it. School is for the birds. You say you're feeling really frustrated about school. Now, frustrated is, is the feeling. School is the content. You're using both sides of your brain to understand both sides of his communication. Now, what happens when we use the fourth stage of empathic listening skills is really fascinating. And I do encourage all of you to do the same. As you authentically seek to understand, as you rephrase content and reflect feeling, you give this other individual, the boy, the girl, the whatever it is, some psychological air. You also help them work through their own thoughts and feelings. As he, she grows in confidence of your sincere desire to really listen and understand that barrier, that barrier between what's going on inside of him or her and what's actually being communicate will communicate it to you actually disappears. So this is what I want to do. I want to actually go into the third part of, let's just say this, oh, this wonderful, wonderful, wonderful part of this book. So here we go. I'm going to get into the third, uh, the fourth part. I'm sorry. Now, we're going to do the same conversation, but we're going to respond in the fourth stage of empathic listening. So here we go. Boy, dad, I've had it. School is for the birds. I want to talk to you and try to get your attention. So here we go. Father says you're really frustrated about school. That's right. That's how I feel. So. The boy goes on to respond and says, I sure am. It's totally impractical. I'm not getting anything out of it. You feel like school's not doing you any good. Hmm. Let me think. Is that what I mean? Well, yeah, I'm just not learning anything. That's going to help me. I mean, look at Joe. He's dropped out of school and he's working on cars. He's making money. Now that's practical. You. Now the father responds. He says, you feel that Joe really has the right idea. Now, the boy, he says, well, um, well, I guess he does in a way. He's really making money now. But in a few years, I bet he'll probably be ticked off at himself. Well, actually, this is what the father says. So going on to the next one. You think Joe's going to feel he made the wrong decision. He's got to. Just look at what he's given up. I mean, if you don't have an education, you just can't make it in this world. The boy responds, education is really important. Oh, yeah. I mean, if you don't have a diploma, if you can't get jobs or go to college, you know, uh, what are you going to do? You've just got to get an education. It's important to your future. It is. And you know what? I'm really worried. Listen, you won't tell mom about this, will you? And then the father responds and says, you don't want your mother to find out? And he says, oh, well, not really. Oh, I mean, I, I guess you can tell her. She'll probably find out anyway. Look, I have a test today, the reading test. And Dad, they said I'm reading on a fourth grade level. Fourth grade! And I'm in junior high school. See? Just like that. What a difference real understanding can make. All the well-meaning advice in the world won't amount to a hill of beans, as Stephen Covey has said. If we're not even addressing the real problem, what's the real problem? What's the boy really trying to say he's talking about? He wants to talk about the problem he's having at school in terms of reading on a fourth grade level. But no, father in the beginning, he just wanted to put himself into his, of course, his son's shoes and start playing the guilt trip and do this and do that. So, and this is what happens when we're caught up in our own autobiography, our own paradigms. We just don't see the world through their glasses. We always see it through our point of view. And so he goes on to say, he says, you know what? I'm going to flunk, dad. I guess I figure if I'm going to flunk, I might as well just quit. But I don't want to quit. So the father goes on to say, hey, you feel torn. You're in the middle of a dilemma. And then the, the boy goes on to say, what should I do, dad? 
And so by seeking first to understand, his father has literally transformed everything. This this transactional opportunity into a transformational opportunity. Now, the father and the son are on the side, the same side of the table looking at the problem. And so the conversation further. He says, well, I could see some things you might want to consider. And then the boy says, like what, dad? And of course, the father retorts. He says, like getting some special help with your reading. Maybe they have some kind of tutoring program over at the tech school. And the boy goes on to say, hey, I've already checked into that. It takes two nights and all day Saturday. That would take so much time. So then you start sensing that emotion in that reply, you know, and then the father moves back into the empathy. He says, that's too much of a price to pay. And then the boy goes on to say that besides that, I told the sixth graders I'd be their coach. Ah, you don't want to let them down, do you? But I'll tell you this, dad. If I really thought that tutoring or that that tutoring course would help, I'd be down there every night. I'd get someone else to coach those kids. Ah, you really want to help, but you doubt if the course will make a difference. Do you think it would, dad? And so now the son is opening up into a more logical approach of everything. And then, of course, ultimately, you know, the father goes on. Now you guys are understanding. You're getting the drift. If you could just hear out your son, your daughter, your spouse, your girlfriend, your boyfriend, your wife, your husband, just as you can right here. Now, I've actually written a couple of things on the blog, of course the ArsenioBuckShow.com that you guys could check out. And I'm probably going to have to implement this fourth stage in there so you guys can actually look at it by reading. Or you're going to have to listen to this over and over and over. But look at it from this perspective. We really never have deep conversations with just about anyone, do we? See, I could look at a lot of relationships I've had, especially with my youngest sister. I never really heard her out until she finally spoke from the heart probably about two years ago. And say, you know what, you used to pick on me. And I'm like, you know what I really do? I understand where you're coming from. Because I was picked on, of course, you know, in terms of your older brother and your older sister. So I think I just wanted to be the bigger person and this and that. And we had a heart talk like no tomorrow. And I understood from her perspective. And I say, I apologize for everything I've done in the past. And so when you actually develop these types of skills... It, next thing you know, it comes back to Dale Carnegie's How to Win and Influence People. You become a person of influence. So I really do. I really, really do want you guys to drill this into your head because I do that it's going to be, I do know that it's going to be a solution to a lot of your problems out there in terms of relationships and whatnot. Especially if you're a father and a mother and you have children. Because sometimes we, and you know what, here in Thailand, I hear it all the time. I've had one, um... One of my students, she came in crying to class one day into a language center. Can you believe that? And she was talking about, oh, I'm being pressured so much by my parents and this and that. And I'll see, this is the problem. The parents are always saying, well, you know, back when I was a child, no one cares about when you were a child. We're trying to address the problem. There's something deep within the child. Now, first and foremost, how the hell can a child be in middle school and read on the fourth grade level in terms of, OK, this is an evaluation from other, I guess you could say, quote unquote, teachers, especially in America. Oh, my God. And so, oh, you read on a fourth grade level. I was that same person back, I think, in fourth grade or middle school. They would say, oh, you read uh, you read on a third grade level. You read on this level. You read on that level. <clears throat> yeah. And you know what? You could just develop that school skill just by reading it out loud at least 30 minutes a day. 30 minutes a day. When you come home, no TV, just say, hey, you know what? Just read this out loud for me. And I want you to practice this over and over and over. Your skill is going to go from that fourth grade level to a damn 10th grade level within weeks. I can promise you that right now. Because guess what? I was that person when I was younger, too. Every time I was called on in class, you know, I was scared. I, I, would, I would read just like this. I would say, um... As you learn to listen deeply to other people, now I can say, as you learn to listen deeply to other people, you will discover tremendous differences in perception. See, guys, I mean, <laughs> this is what I've done from basically reading every day. You could develop anything that you're going through as a child. And you know what? If you're a mother and you're a father, you need to be supportive rather than building up your autobiographical responses. You need to think logically and be on the same side. Oh, I guess you say the same side of the table as your son or your daughter. Do you understand what I'm saying? So 
With that being said, guys, blog is on thearseniobuckshow.com. Please stay tuned for the Gary V pre-recorded podcast coming Monday and Tuesday and Thursday and Friday in terms of Napoleon Hill. Interview coming up Wednesday with a talk show host, Harvesting Happiness with Lisa Cypress. So please stay tuned for all of these nice podcasts. And there will be other ones coming up probably this evening or tomorrow evening or Tuesday evening. We're going to have double podcasts for a couple of days. So... Until then, people, have a wonderful morning, afternoon, and evening. I hope this helped you. And, of course, if you liked it, shared it. If you shared it, you liked it. This is your host, Arsenio, over and out.